guys for joining us. Us, all of us. <laughs> um, so if, if, you, if you don't mind giving uh, just a couple sentences about your background um, before we get started, why don't you go, Shree? Yeah, absolutely. So I, my name is Shree Bose. I'm a senior at Harvard University, very close to here. Um, I got started in science pretty early in life. I was building things ever since I was little. Um, but I didn't really start asking questions that matter to me until I was 15 and my grandfather passed away of cancer. Um, and after that, since I grew up in an amazing time where I can search anything I want online, I started learning about cancer just on my own. Um, and that sort of led me to find mentors, to start working in a lab, and I did this really cool project on drug resistance in ovarian cancer, which actually won me the grand prize of the first ever Google Global Science Fair. And then after that, I got the chance to talk to a lot of students and teachers, and I started understanding the problems that a lot of kids have with getting started in tech and actually building with hardware. And so I started this company called Piper, along with an amazing co-founder. Um, and we've been really building these kits that let kids get started with building hardware while also playing on this virtual interface. So we ran an awesome Kickstarter. We've been running this company for the past two years, and I'm about to graduate in less than a month, which is exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Hardy? Uh, hey, I'm Hardy. I'm a mechanical engineer. I, uh, I grew up in Estonia, and uh, I founded a company called GrabCAD, uh, and what GrabCAD, you can explain it in many ways, but uh, we basically build a community of three million mechanical engineers who are using GrabCAD for different things. But the underlying concept of starting GrabCAD was internet has been such, such a big impact on different industries, and I was thinking how can it uh, impact manufacturing and design, and we build a lot of different uh, sub-communities uh, inside GrabCAD, and, and the notion is, how could you leverage this amazing knowledge pool that is out there and connect people all over the world? And we have a repository where people can go and download the files and use in their designs. We have challenges where companies like GE and NASA come to and give us a difficult problem, and, and uh, the community uses uh, our tool to solve these uh, problems. And we had a product called Workbench that bring people together when they're designing, and one of our customers were uh, your company. And and uh, so, so that was GrabCAD. We, I'm not with the company anymore. Uh, I was a founder. We sold to uh, Stratasys a year ago. And uh, what I've done since is I started a nonprofit where I'm also very passionate about education. Uh, I donated um, 50 3D printers to schools in Estonia, but not only 3D printers but also the whole curriculum and really trying to figure out how can you build a community around teaching and uh, learning, learning STEM. And one of the key takeaways was that I thought that maybe we should, the teachers should teach uh, STEM, but it turned out that the students are the best teachers and, and they're great in curriculum. So I'm, I'm, I'm building now a, a young community in one country that are passionate about STEM. And uh, on my day job now I'm a, I'm a general partner at uh, Matrix Partners, so I'm a VC now on day job. So that uh, brings me the money so I can do all this other stuff. <laughs> awesome. I like, the, I like the quick turnaround on that cycle. <laughs> um, and Dale, we heard from you earlier. Yeah, I yeah. probably just go into <laughs> questions. I think I yeah. had my... I'm, I met Dale. Um, he, he actually worked together with me on the DARPA project, um, bringing, the, bringing the expertise about how, how to actually bring technology to the classroom. Um, so what I want to know is, is from your perspective, how, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple elements for a maker to go from being a maker into a business. You know, there's the design process, there's the prototyping process, bringing something into production, and then building an operation around it. And I'm wondering from, you know, from your, your perspective, Sri, like how... How did you know what to do? How did you know where to start? Um, what were the resources that you used? I think one of the biggest benefits of starting really young was the fact that I didn't know what I wasn't supposed to know how to do yet. So I, I think I was lucky in that regard. But I, I, we definitely went through a very iterative design process. I mean, we started out with really buying pieces just online and throwing something together, taking it to schools, having kids play with games that were 
pretty shoddy to begin with, and then really walking away with the feedback that we wanted to make the game better, we wanted to have actual pieces where you were building hardware that would interface with the game in a way that was powerful and meaningful to the kids. Um, but yeah, it was definitely one of those things where the doubt that anybody would ever want this was constantly there. <laughs> and I think that was one of the incredible things about actually launching a crowdsourcing campaign because it was really not only a way to get initial funds to actually be able to set up the entire operation behind it, but it was also a way to gauge how much people wanted this product. And I know when we launched through Kickstarter, so we had to set a goal for ourselves, and if you don't hit the goal, then you, the money goes back to all of your funders. Um, and for us, we set our goal at 50K, and we had decided before this campaign, actually, that if we actually didn't hit 100K, then we knew that people didn't want this enough to actually build out from there. And so we, the entire time we were running this campaign, we were kind of on edge. We were like, oh, well, maybe we won't hit that benchmark. And we ended up hitting 280K. And so at that point, we realized that this wasn't just a product that we thought was cool, that we wanted the world to have. It was really a lot of people around the world who wanted this. And from there, we could actually I mean, we launched our Kickstarter with one kit that we had built out of like pieces, and then we like shot it from a bunch of angles to make it look like we had a bunch of them. Um, but <laughs> really, it was it was honestly building a product and then actually getting a gauge for how how much it was wanted, um, and then the process from there has been more traditional. But the the idea that you can gauge and then build mm -hmm. it has been. A, a tremendous boon for actually figuring out what people want. Yeah. Dale, when someone comes to you and they say, you know, I have I have this idea that of something and I've been making it and I've been to Maker Fair for three years and I really I wanna I wanna take this to the next level, like what do you say to them? Um you know, I, I think the real answer is it's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, there's no overnight success here. It's it's yeah. not necessarily the same model as software. Um, and and it, these iterations take time, and you have to go. What, what I kind of see, though, with makers often is <laughs> David Lang used once used the term. Uh, you know, they're interested in the adventure. They actually look forward to that. You know, it, it, and if you're not into that as an adventure, like this is fun. I get to learn a lot of stuff. I go to China or whatever it is. I figure this out. You know, if, if that's not interesting to you, then probably just dismiss your idea and move on to something else because it's going to take a lot of hard work. And I, I think some of it I, I just sort of reflect back and say, you know, you're going to spend the next couple of years of your life on this almost exclusively. Is it worth it? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and not necessarily whether it'll be successful or not. It's just like, is it worth your own investment of time and energy there? But I, I would also say that the thing that, you know, when you talk about Kickstarter and things that I think what we're seeing that is not discussed about is people are developing products, but what they're really building is a community. And without the community, they really, that's, the, the, you know, again, open source hardware and things, they're practically giving away the product. What they want to own over time is that relationship with the community, the people that trust them, come to them for, for other things. And, and I, I think if you look at it in those terms, uh, uh, you know, that's really what their focus wants to be on is, is, in a sense, creating customers before they have a product, mm -hmm. developing that as a community, where that community begins to add value to the product and the process that they're, they're doing and tells them really what future products to build. Mm -hmm. we, we experienced the same thing with our, our machine was that we, we found people in the community that actually had expertise that we didn't even have yet who were as excited about what we were doing as we were, um, who were willing to help us. So it is this kind of secret sauce, like you're so closely connected to people, you know, it helps you have that passion to get over the, the hard parts. Um, Hardy, since you, you worked with kind of companies large and, and small with your platform, are there any things that you see, like from your perspective, like things that are really missing, like things that are big stumbling blocks for makers who want to turn their passion into a business, um, you know, that might, might ease the journey? I think I, I'm a huge fan of Kickstarter. That really, you know, helped, helped, uh, helped to validate your idea before you take that long, painful journey on building stuff. But I think what's still missing is that going from have a prototype that is 3D printed out in an FDM machine to a final 
product. That is a very, very long and painful journey. And I think we a little bit helped to close that gap because we had, there is a segment of our customers that on a business-wise were terrible, but as a <laughs> as a innovation side and like it was really I like that segment which was those makers who have a prototype and then now they're building a first product and they use, and we had a community of professional engineers so when they realized that they're in trouble they came to came to our community and they were, and what I what I saw there was these people have amazing ideas. They really have amazing ideas, but they really are missing that, what is possible. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you have engineers who know exactly what's possible, and because of they live in such a constrained world, they, they're losing a little bit of that creati creativity and naiveness. And that's what I think we tried them to help, and we were, we were, uh, we were uh, somewhat successful, I would call it like that. But I think that process of closing that gap is something that, you know, if I would start another company, that's definitely one area where I would really focus on, on, on closing that gap. Mm -hmm. That feels really relevant to me also for, for this crowd being more corporate than startup is, you know, I'm, I'm wondering actually from all of your perspectives on what, how do we bring people together? How do we bring the, the corporate body of knowledge on how to take something from a prototype and get it into production, how do we bring that like, really solid value with the value of the naiveness and this passion and this community that we get from the maker movement? Like, what's, what's the natural way for those two groups of people to share with each other, like share the spirit from the maker movement, share the expertise from the, the corporate environment? Um, Sri, do you have any? Have you ever worked with a larger company, or I personally haven't? But I, I think in part it might just be about building the infrastructure to make that type of community sharing possible. I know when we we were developing Piper and designing the entire process, one thing that we really, really wanted in our final product was this aspect of sharing. We wanted the kids who had the actual kits to be able to build hardware and then actually code in their own like game challenges where they could share their hardware creations in the same sort of format as the actual kit game itself. And so for us, it was really making sure that that infrastructure was there for all of these makers who were playing with our kit to actually be able to build with it and share with it and share their passion and that naive nature that actually a lot of really great innovation comes from. So that was, as the bigger structure, I guess, mm -hmm. we were really focused on building the form that kids could use to share. Yeah, and that way it seems like you are acting as the company and interacting exactly. with the kids as the makers, yeah. um, which benefits you. Um, it seems like maybe maybe a larger company could build that kind of that information flow. Yeah, I think one of the challenges for companies, it, 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 I think one of the foundational ideas around the maker movement is sharing. And so it's, it's really from a company's point of view, what are you willing to share? Uh, how open are you willing to be about what you're doing? I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Kevin Nolan will be talking about the first build, and I think it's a great example uh, of, of that, and they've, they've had to kind of rework some, some of their own ideas, uh, both in willing to share their patent portfolio uh, as well as uh, ideas and processes. Uh, but uh, another insight is companies like Intel uh, realized that they had makers inside the company, and they could leverage that, and so they used those makers to also connect to the outside community. I, I think the perfect world is, is you have this community inside and then you're connecting to an, an external community mm -hmm. that brings you new ideas that they can't entirely develop themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the GE example is uh, it's appl home appliances. Most makers aren't going to develop a new microwave or, or refrigerator, but if you put a USB port into one of those, what would they do with it? Mm -hmm. What attachments and other things? So it's thinking in a more open, collaborative way uh, and, and really being open to that, not trying to control it and say, like, we want to open, but we want this result. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's in conflict. So it, it, it uh, I, I, but I, I think it, 
in many ways, it can be a rediscovery of some of the engineering talent you talked about. It, they're frozen, uh, you know, they're locked up. They're in committee land all the time trying to get a job approved. They will go over to an open makerspace and create something on their own just because mm -hmm. they want to prove their idea, uh, it, you know, at least deserves to be real on one level yeah. or not. And, and GE is definitely, like, this is one corporation we worked a lot as well, and you can see that they're really rethinking how they're doing things and valuing these things. And, and we had, we had a, like, exactly what you said, there were public projects, and we did also private communities right. for these guys. And, and what I saw with GE came to us and did a challenge where they wanted to reduce the weight of a jet engine, and they run a, they thought that this 3D printing is a cool thing, maybe they can use 3D printing for, for uh, that. And they did a challenge where they, it's a simple challenge, redesigned the brackets using 3D printing, and they, I think they got 800 submissions from GrabCat community and and they reduced the weight of 85%, but they were very open about what are they going to get. They didn't get the final project, final design. They got three amazing ideas that they knew that they need to combine and take it to the manufacturing, and they knew that that they need to need to put their efforts into this because community is not interested in in like doing dumb work. They're doing they they're interested in learning and doing something that they get value out of that. And the fact that the GE scientists were on GrabCat community every day giving feedback from for people uh, who otherwise were students in in anywhere in the world who never had access to these people. That's those were the reasons why um, this 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 challenge was such a big success. Yeah, I can imagine also those those people who are contributing getting immense validation for the work that they do and the talents that they have, which is is pretty incredible. So I hear I hear. In terms of working with larger companies, um, part of it is being open to to what resources you may already have, and also being open to to it being open ended. And I think about you know when I was a, like starting to be a scientist in college, everybody talked about the mistakes. It was like, oh, Dupont made so much money off of like these three mistakes, or or Dow off of these mistakes. And I think about how what is the penalty for never making any mistakes? Like what? What if we did have these maker spaces in the inside companies where it was okay to make mistakes and explore, and those people feel empowered to reach out to the community, you know, within reason and draw in more, more expertise and more pollination? Um, it seems to me like this con connectivity would be key to to actually innovating, actually solving problems in ways that are even more sensitive to the needs of the people they're solving them for. Um, when you get input. Just like if you're a big company, you can get that input, or a small company being on Kickstarter. But it, but it starts by thinking, am I ready to think differently? Yeah. We turned down so many companies that wanted to run Challenge and GrabCat because we really care about the community we built, and we knew that this company will come in and they are just going to not be happy because they're not ready to think differently. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. I think this has been a great panel. <laughs> I learned a lot. Do any of you have any any final words to say? Oh, this guy. Oh, I'm, Hello. Just, I'm just here to observe. Yeah. Just, okay, just the on. only thing I'd say is I would really like to see American manufacturers get more engaged, more aware of the maker movement and the problem sets that uh, 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 small makers have. Uh, people are going to China just because they can find uh, uh, someone to talk to over there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the ideas we have here is the resurgence of, of small uh, batch manufacturing in America mm -hmm. and be able to step from, I, I, I funded a Kickstarter and I got a couple thousand orders to go to 10,000 to go to you know 100,000. That's what we need and we need partners in that to, to yeah. do that. It looks small now, but yeah. it's going to be important. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Excellent. You. With that, thank you very much for a great panel and a great discussion. Thank you for leading this discussion. Right?